Well, tonight we're continuing our series on worship, uh, which we've titled Altars and Idols. And we're going to be in Genesis chapter 4. We're going to be looking at really the first time that we see an act of worship in the Bible. And we're going from Genesis to Revelation. We're, we're, we're tracking the development of, of worship in the Bible and in the Word of God. And so last week, as you'll recall, we looked at worship in the Garden of Eden and how Adam and Eve were, again, living their whole lives, were called to live their whole lives as worship as unto God. But today in, in Genesis 4, we're going to see what um, is really a, a first act of worship. But before we do that, I, I just want to look briefly at Romans chapter 12, which we've looked at both weeks, Romans chapter 12, that establishes for us, it answers the question for us, what is worship in the, in the biggest and the broadest possible sense? You'll recall that we've looked at this passage to lay a foundation for us as it, it is the most concise definition in the Bible, the written word of what worship is. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Lord, as we spend time in your word tonight, that you would Teach us and guide us and instruct us and help us. Open our hearts to receive the word that it is you want us to receive tonight. Open our ears, open our eyes. Uh, help us to hear from you tonight. That's, that's our deepest desire is to have fellowship and communion with you. I pray that you would help me to communicate your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 12. Uh, verse 1, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world or the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing... You may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. If you'll recall, the thesis of, of what worship is in the biggest sense, in the broadest sense, sense is that all of our lives are, be to, are to be lived unto the Lord as an act of worship. Remember I talked about worshiping the Lord as we go through the drive through at Mama Margie's, that that in, in every sense, in everything that we do, we're to live it as to the glory of God. And that when we live our lives that way, totally surrendered, totally submitted unto the Lord, that that in its most purest sense is worship. And not being fit into the mold of the world, but to have our lives and our minds renewed and transformed by the word of God. The world is trying to force us into a certain shape, to try to force us into a certain pattern, a certain mold. And that is a mold that is not glorifying to God. And we see the world put its stamp and its mark on people all the time. God's people are called to be different. We're called to be distinct. We're not it's called to fit into the world's pattern, but to be conformed into the nature and they have the nature and character of Christ conformed in us as we submit to the word of God and, and as we live our lives that way, that truly is worship. Day in, day out, moment by moment, we offer our lives to the Lord as an act of worship. You recall Jesus in John 4 said that the Father was seeking such people who would worship him in this way. He's searching for worship, worshipers. And when Jesus says this to the woman at the well, he's saying that God is searching for something more than simply people who will gather at a certain time and a place. That he's looking for something more than people who will simply come to church and sing a few songs. 
When Jesus says he's looking for people, worshipers, searching the earth for them, looking for them, who will worship him in spirit and in truth, he's looking for those who will serve him, who will love him, who will obey him, who will have fellowship with him. Not in a building, but their whole lives in fellowship and communion with God. That's the, that's the beauty, that's the genius of what we have in Christ is that wherever we are, we have access to the presence of God. Wherever we are, we can have fellowship with God at any moment in time. He's as close, we've heard it said how many times, he's as close as his name. As as soon as we call on him, he is there, he's always there. We don't have to come to a certain place at a certain time to experience the presence of God. No, the presence of God should fill our lives. Our homes should be filled with the presence of God. The, the sweetness that we experience in worship, did you know that you can experience that in your home? Imagine that. Imagine a home filled with the presence of God, a marriage filled with the presence of God, a family filled with the presence of God. Even in the day in and the day out stuff that we all have to do, when we do it as unto the Lord, we do it with a sense of the Lord's presence in our lives. We do nothing in and of ourselves or in and unto ourselves. It's all done to the glory of God. And this kind of living, these lives of, of worship, it doesn't diminish our corporate times when we gather together as the church to express our, our worship in song. It doesn't diminish that. In fact, it puts a fire under that because we're living for God. We, we love God. We want to be with him, to be in his presence, to be with the people of God. It puts an anticipation in our hearts. Instead of, uh, well, it's just something I got to check off my list today to to somehow appease God. That's the wrong way, the wrong view of worship. And so we're talking about really one idea expressed in two separate ways. We're talking about a lifestyle of worship, obedience to God, living for the glory of God, every area of life under the lordship of Christ moment by moment, day by day, in fellowship, communion with God through His Spirit, that lifestyle of worship. And we're also talking about the act of worship, the act of of expressing our love and our gratitude and our thanksgiving and our praise and our adoration to God. So it's the lifestyle of worship that manifests itself in the act of singing our songs and singing our praise and singing our worship to the Lord. And tonight we're going to focus in on that act of worship. So Genesis chapter 4, again, as I said, this really is the first time that we see in the Bible an act of worship. And so we're going to see what is it that we can, what principles can we pull out from this story about worship and incorporate them and apply them in our lives and in our worship unto God. So you'll remember last week, of course you know the story of the Bible. God created the world good. Humanity entered into sin and we have made it go astray, creation. And Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve sinned and God drove them away from his presence, away from the garden that that he put a a flaming sword there with an angel to guard the way to the tree of life. And then chapter 4 now tells us what happens to Adam's family moving forward, living life outside of the garden, outside of God's presence. It says, now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. So Adam and Eve, they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And it tells us their occupation. Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. So Abel becomes a shepherd, and 
He, he takes care of, of flocks and herds. And, and Cain takes after his father Adam, who was to work the ground. And he becomes a farmer and, and, and he, he begins to produce crops. And in verse 3 it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell, his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well... Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you or to rule over you, but you must rule over it. And we know the rest of the story as the story develops. Cain is very angry and he lures his brother out into the field and murders his brother and... God pronounces a curse on Cain and and drives him away from the the human family. He has to live in exile. But I want to focus in here not on the results of the story, but on this act of worship. We see two offerings that are brought. Cain brings an offering of the fruit of the ground. He brings an offering of produce. He brings an offering of harvest. And Abel brings an offering of his flock, one of the lambs. It says the firstborn. And he brings not only a a firstborn offering of the flock, but he brings the best part of the the lamb. It's what's called the fat portions, the, the best part. And so the question is that we need to answer, why does God accept Abel's offering but reject Cain's offering? They bring two offerings. They both come at the same time to the presence of the Lord. The Lord receives one of them. He looks with favor on one of them. And the other he rejects. Now many uh, believe and assume that it's because Abel brought an offering that contained blood, a blood sacrifice. And because Cain didn't do that, his offering was rejected. Uh, That's certainly a possibility. I'm not going to rule that out completely. However, the text doesn't say that that's what the issue is. And we don't see here that this is a quote-unquote sin offering. It seems as though this was an offering of fellowship in the course of time that possibly they had a, a season of time where they would offer offerings to the Lord. And what you should know is that a grain offering or a fruit offering was a type of offering that was common under Old Testament Mosaic law, that people in Israel would bring an offering of of their produce to the Lord to, to, to celebrate what God had given them. We see that in Exodus chapter 34, verse 26. We see it in Deuteronomy 26, verse 2. So God received all kinds of offerings. It wasn't always having to do with an animal, an animal sacrifice, that you could offer to the Lord uh, a produce offering, a harvest offering. And again, this was not, it doesn't tell us anywhere in here that this is an atoning sacrifice, a sin sacrifice, but it it really was a, a fellowship offering, an offering of worship unto the Lord. And again, we see throughout the whole Old Testament that God receives these kinds of offerings. Do you remember when David, and he was with his mighty men, and he, he was separated from his hometown in Bethlehem, and, and he made an offhanded comment. He said, oh, that I could drink from the wells in Bethlehem, that I could taste of, of my hometown water. Do you ever visit another town, and you taste the water, and it's like, how do these people drink this stuff? You ever... You ever we all drink bottled water now, so that doesn't really happen to us in, as much anymore. I remember as a kid, we'd travel and go stay with a relative or friends outside of town, and they'd serve us water, and it, it just tasted like sulfur. It tasted like, it just didn't taste right. Anyway, and my parents would say, there's nothing wrong with it, just drink it. And 
Anyway, we would turn our nose up in it because we were spoiled little kids. It didn't taste good like San Antonio water, you know, San Antonio water. My kids now won't drink the tap water. They have to have bottled, bottled water. Anyway, we drank from the hose and survived. I digress. Uh, but his men hear him make that comment, and, and so they break through. They, they go and... They, they go by night and they go under the cover of darkness and these, these men who love David so much, they risk their own lives breaking through enemy lines, breaking through occupied territory, drawing from the well of Bethlehem and bringing it back to David and saying, we, we, we heard what you said and we went and got what you wanted. And what did he do with it? Did he guzzle it down and say, oh, I can tell that's from Bethlehem. No, in front of them he takes that offering that water and he pours it out on the ground and we say man if I saw him do that I would feel kind of bad about risking my life to go and get this this water for David he just poured it in the dirt but what he was doing was offering it up as an offering to the Lord as an act of worship he didn't diminish what they had done. In fact, he took it to the highest level as he gave it to God. And he said, I can't, I can't have these, men, these men's blood, their lives on my hands. I, who am I to, to receive such a gift? I'm not worthy of them risking their lives. Their lives belong to the Lord. And so I will pour this out unto the Lord. And so he gives that to the Lord as an offering unto him. So we see all through the Old Testament that the Lord accepts all kinds of different offerings. Yet, again, he rejects Cain's offering. And so I think that the real issue here centers in on the way it describes Abel's offering. And so let's look at that again. It says, Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Abel offered up his first and his best to the Lord in worship. He, he didn't bring the lame animal. He didn't bring the diseased lamb. He didn't bring the old goat that had barely had any, any fat left on it, right? You know, skin and bones, diseased to the Lord. No, he brought the firstborn, the brand new and the best. He brought his first and his best. Cain, it says, just brought of the fruit of the ground. There is an, an ancient uh, rabbinic writing on this text that says that what Cain brought, again, this isn't in the Bible, it's a, it's a commentary on the Bible, but an ancient commentary, which is now part of the Jewish tradition that Abel, that Cain brought the leftovers, that he brought literally the refuse, the garbage, the slop, what they would go and throw out to the animals. He, he brought the, the old, the, the moldy, the, the throwaway to the Lord. He didn't bring his first and he didn't bring his best. Abel brought that first fruit offering and Cain gives God his leftovers. And the difference in this, the difference in this truly is the attitude of the heart. The attitude of the heart. Remember, man looks on the outward appearance. I can't see your heart. I can't see your mind. I can't see your emotions. I can't see your thoughts. I can't see your feelings. Only God sees those things. And that's what God looks at. We just see the outward expression. We, we just see what we see with our natural eyes. But God sees much deeper than that. In fact, God, the Bible says that he knows us even better than we know ourselves. That we can even be self-deceived. But God truly knows the truth in every situation. And as God examined the heart of Cain that would cause him to not bring his first and his best. And as God looked at the heart of Abel, who, which caused him to bring his first and his best to the Lord. He had regard for Abel's offering and he rejected Cain's. You see, the issue was not what they brought in their hands. The issue what was in their heart. 
the content of their heart. And the content of their heart determined what they brought with their hands to the Lord. Abel loving the Lord, Abel being a man of faith, as Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11.4 says this about Abel. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. What was the difference in the two offerings? Not only was it the content of what they brought, it was the content of their heart. That Abel offered his offering in faith, and Cain offered his in unbelief. 1 John 3.12 says this about Cain, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. This doesn't say that Cain became evil when he murdered him. It says that Cain was already evil. And his murdering of his brother was the manifestation of the evil that was already in his heart. You see, Cain's heart was not towards the Lord. He didn't love the Lord. He came to the Lord begrudgingly. But Abel loved the Lord. Abel was a man of faith. Abel was one who was willing to give God his first and his best. And their worship that they brought to the Lord flowed out of what was already in their hearts, which resulted in Abel bringing true worship to God and Cain offering up false worship to God. So what are some lessons that we can take away from this? What are some things that we can learn from and apply them right here, right now, as we want to worship God and, and exalt him and have him magnified in our lives? I have four of them for us tonight. The first is that there is worship that God receives and there is worship that God rejects. We see that very clearly here. Two acts of worship, two outward expressions of worship to the Lord. The Lord receives one of them and he rejects another. Proverbs 21 verse 27 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with evil intent. Any attempt to worship God apart from how he has prescribed himself to be worshipped will be rejected. This is what God tells Cain in verse 7. After the offering is rejected and Cain is very sad and angry and depressed, his countenance falls, God comes to him in grace and mercy Offering extending to Cain a, a way back into fellowship, which Cain rejects. What does he tell Cain? He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? What this means is that God had shown them. He had told them. He had expressed to them, this is how I am to be worshipped. And Cain chose to do it his way. Cain chose to do it another way. Cain chose, thought that he could go to God, not on God's terms, but on his own terms. And so any attempt to worship God apart from how he intends to be worshipped, that worship will be rejected. It will not be received. And again, Proverbs 21 27 says that this sacrifice of the wicked is actually an abomination to the Lord. And so what this means for us is that only through Christ will our worship be accepted. Because it is only through Christ that we are made righteous before God. And it's only the worship of the righteous that is received and accepted by God. So any attempt to worship God apart from Christ apart from the, 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 me, the method, the mode of salvation, the plan of salvation that God has instituted, any attempt to, to circumvent Christ and go to God in worship will be rejected wholeheartedly. 
It's arrogance because it is saying, I don't need Christ, God, I don't need your son. It's rejecting the offer of salvation that God has given. And so we need to understand that there is worship that God receives, offered up by the people of God who have been redeemed by Christ, the righteous, the redeemed, and there is worship that God rejects those who want to come to God not through Christ, but on their own terms. And we know that our righteousness, our own terms, is as filthy rags. Secondly, not everything that is called worship is true worship. God accepts true worship, just as Jesus said, the Father is seeking such worshipers who will worship him in spirit, and in truth. But here we see that Cain, his offering is not offered up in spirit and in truth. It's not a genuine act of worship, though he's going through the motions, though he's attending the service, though he's a part of the liturgy, though when they say stand, he stands, and when they say sit, he sits, though he may even sing the songs, His heart is not towards God in spirit and in truth. This is the kind of worship that God will accept. Spirit and in truth worship. What that means is sincerity of heart. Sincerity of heart. Not just paying God lip service. Not not just singing the songs because they're on the screen. But the, the words aren't truly coming from our heart. How would you feel if your wife on, or your husband on Valentine's Day or your anniversary, let's say anniversary, they go and they pull off some, some speech from some movie of some very romantic thing and they memorize this speech and they tell it to you on Valentine's Day and you're so moved and you're like, wow, that's so amazing. And they're like, I don't really mean it. It's just words that I found and I just memorized them and read them to you. How would you feel about that? How does God feel when we come into his house and we pretend to worship him by reading songs on a screen, but our hearts are a million miles away? We're thinking about the Cowboys. We're thinking about our fantasy league. We're thinking about work tomorrow. We're thinking about the argument we had in the car on the way here. We're thinking about where are we going to go eat after this. That's not worship in spirit and in truth. Now to all of us, you can be lifting your hands. You can be singing the most beautiful song. You can maybe even conjure up a few fake tears to come down your eyes. And we all say, wow. And God sits up in heaven and he's not impressed at all. At all. Cain brought an offering, but he was not worshiping God. He may have paid God lip service, but his heart was not engaged. Maybe he was doing it to impress others. Maybe he was just doing it because that's what his family does, and he was trying to get Adam and Eve off his case. Maybe he wanted others to to think he was a true worshiper of God. Man, if we're coming to God in worship and we're, we're more concerned about what other people are thinking about us and our thoughts aren't even on God, we're more concerned about what will they think if I sing or what will they think if I clap or what will they think if I lift my hands or what will they think if I dance or, or what will they think if I come to the altar and pray and, and I'm, I'm thinking about everybody else except for the one I'm supposed to be worshiping. No, there is, there, is a, there, there is worship that is true and genuine, and then there are things that are called worship that are not worship at all. If it's just lip service, but not heart surrender, it is not true worship. Number three thing we see here clearly is that true worshipers bring their first and their best. True worshipers bring their first and their best. 
And the implications of this are too many to list. You can just pray over this all week and ask God to continue to reveal ways to, ways to your heart for you to bring him your first and bring him your best. But I'll give you a few tonight. In our act of worship, ways that we give God our first and our best, well, number one, it means we're on time. Amen? It means we're on time. God, God our, our first and our best isn't being late to worship God. We're talking about the act of worship. Is being late your first and your best? Well, no, it's not. So being on time, that's, that's number one. If I'm going to give God my first and I'm going to give God my best, I'm going to do everything I can to be there on time. Now, I understand that certain things happen sometimes. I understand that sometimes the alarm doesn't go off or, or the, the, you get a flat tire or someone steals your car. You know, I understand that. I understand that sometimes there's catastrophic events that would pre prevent us from being here on time. I think God understands that too, an act of God, an act of nature, right? A tornado comes through and, you know, knocks out your, your whole neighborhood. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. But if I'm bringing God my first and my best, it means I'm making every effort to be here on time because I'm meeting with the Lord. I'm here. I'm coming to worship God. If I'm going to give God my first and my best, and this is where I'm really going to start getting in your business, just putting that little airbag around it for you. It means I don't stay up all night on Saturday night. Why? Because I'm getting up early to go worship God. Because I'm going to bring in my first and I'm going to bring in my best. And if I stay up all night Saturday night doing whatever... I'm, I'm going to have a hard time getting up to worship God in the morning. Now, I understand. I understand. There's some, some of you who may, even may be here tonight. You, you work on Saturday nights. And it is, an, it is a supreme act of sacrifice to be here on Sunday morning. I, I, under, I understand that. And God understands that, too. I'm not talking about working on Saturday night. I'm talking about, you know, binge watching whatever season of whatever. I'm talking about catching up on, you know, trying to watch you know, all six Lord of the Rings movies on, on Saturday night. You know, that, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Just, just not living intentionally, not thinking, okay, it's Saturday night, I'm going to worship God tomorrow, I'm going to get to bed early so I can get up early so that when I get to church at 10 a.m., which is not early, by the way, how many of you have to be at work before 10 a.m.? All right, 10 a.m. is not early. You should be able to be anywhere by 10 a.m. Even Dallas, Texas, you should be able to get there by 10 a.m. No, I'm going to go to bed early. I'm going to get a good night's rest. I'm going to get up early so that on Sunday morning I'm... I'm not walking into worship, this act of worship unto holy most high God, wiping the sleep out of my eyes with morning breath, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brush my teeth. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to get some coffee in me. I'm going to read some word, and, and I'm going to come rolling in here at 10 a.m. ready to go, ready to worship God. Because I didn't just wake up five minutes before. Now those are just some, some practical ways in our act of worship that we can bring God our first and our best. But now as we shift, if we'll shift to the lifestyle of worship, living all of life unto the glory of God, man, bringing God my first and my best, well, what does that look like on a day-by-day -day basis? What does that look like as I intend to worship God and to live a life solely devoted to Him? Well, I can tell you, uh, for me and my house, as we are endeavoring to give God our first and our best, it means we devote the first part of our day to seeking the Lord and not waiting until the day is well spent. This means setting our alarm clock earlier I don't know if you knew it, 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 you can actually move it earlier. 
it has this feature on there. Setting it earlier specifically to devote time to the Lord at the first part of our day. Now this is an area that is for me a great area of personal sanctification because by nature I am not a morning person. Really in the morning I'm not even a person. It takes me until about 11 a.m. till I, my personality loads in the morning. I need several cups of coffee. I am, I am a night owl by nature. I can stay up till 3 a.m. every night without even trying. That's just how I'm wired. I can also sleep until 1 p.m. without even trying. That's, that's just, that's my natural rhythm. But if I want to give God my first and my best, it means I, I personally have to lay that on the altar. I have to sanctify. I have to set some things apart in my life to do that. And that's what me and, me and my house, we're endeavoring to do. Now, I'm not laying that upon you as some sort of law, some sort of, um, you know, if you don't do this, God's not going to love you. Don't hear me saying that today. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is if we're going to give God our first and our best, if we wait till the end of the day, till the day is past, often what we have to offer the Lord truly isn't our best, is it? I, I don't know about you. I'm tired at the end of the day. I, 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 my energy is well spent. My, my words are well spent. You know, guys, we only have like 3,000 words that we use in a day. Like four of them are like, uh, or like, 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 2,500 of them are, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, yeah, <clears throat> nothing. You know, that's like 2,500 of our words. When we get to the end of the day, we don't have a whole lot to offer the Lord. But, but when we set aside specific time, and truly hear me in this, set it aside as holy unto the Lord, separated, marked off, sanctified, I'm getting up early, not to catch up on emails, not to read the news, not to see how, you know, the world melted down overnight. No, I'm waking up early to spend time with my God, to spend time in personal prayer and personal worship and in the word and personal devotion. Again, this is not a salvation issue. I'm not saying you have to do this to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. Don't misunderstand me in hearing this. And these are not religious duties that you must perform to somehow appease God. But these are me and us and you taking our relationship with the Lord seriously and making it a priority. Amen. This first and best principle can be applied to our tithes and our offerings. If we wait to the end of the month or the end of the week, we, 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 we may not have anything left to offer to the Lord. But as, if we do this principle as soon as we get paid and we take it and we set it aside as holy as unto the Lord, our first and our best, You'll be shocked at how God will make the rest of it go further and farther than you ever imagined. It is a principle that God has given us, and he blesses that act of worship. And first and best in our lifestyle of worship means that we should acknowledge God's provision and blessing in every area of our lives. We should acknowledge God with thanksgiving all the time, moment by moment. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge his blessings. James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. That means any time in life you ever experience anything good, it should well up in our hearts with worship and praise unto God. Acknowledging God for his blessing. Acknowledging God for his goodness. Before uh, service tonight, I was in my office and 
I needed to brush my teeth. And I went into my bathroom. I have a little bathroom in my office. And I, I turned the handle on my faucet. And guess what happened? Water came out. And I just said, what a blessing. What a blessing. I had a toothbrush to brush my teeth. I had toothpaste to keep my teeth healthy. You know, like, the majority of human existence hasn't had those simple blessings. The majority of human existence, like, tooth disease and tooth decay was one of the number one cause of death because of infection in the gums. And we don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. If, if, if up until, I mean, when was running water invented? In like the 20s? I don't know. My grandparents pooped in an outhouse. They called it the honeydew pot. I don't know why they called it that. I mean, think about it. What a wretched existence. And we just push this magic button and it all just disappears. I don't know where it goes. Somebody else takes care of it. It's, it's glorious. The majority of human existence, what do we do with our waste? Where do we get our water? How do we survive today was the prevailing thought of ev literally almost everyone who's ever lived. And we just turn this little faucet and out comes the water and we brush our teeth and, and, and we just go through life so ungrateful. But James says, that's a gift from God. And if it's a gift from God, it should be received as a gift from God, which is to be received with thanksgiving. One of the things that discourages me as a parent more than anything is when my kids receive a gift and they are ungrateful. It's so discouraging and disheartening to see. And you teach, we try to teach our children, say thank you. Be grateful. Show some appreciation. Somebody paid a great price and somebody thought of you. Don't be a spoiled brat. <laughs> and we should acknowledge the goodness and the blessings of God that we experience moment by moment. Really, any time we're living life and there's not some sort of catastrophic disaster, is a moment to stop and say, God, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the blessings that you have given to me. This is why covetousness will rob us of worship because we're looking at everybody else and we want what they have. This is why Paul says that covetousness is idolatry. It's worship redirected in the wrong direction. So... What point am I on? I'm on point three. True worshipers bring their first and their best. And part of what that means is that in the lifestyle of worship, we acknowledge God's goodness and provision and blessing in every area of life. Number four. I said there were four of these. I have four on my paper. The act of worship is proceeded, the act, okay, the act of worship is proceeded by the lifestyle of worship. You see, Cain wasn't living the lifestyle of worship. And he thought he could simply get by with the act of worship. Abel, we're told, was a true man of faith who brought, through the course of his life of worship, who brought an offering to the Lord, an act of worship. But too many, even Christians today, too many Christians approach the act of worship not as the overflow of my life of worship offered up to the Lord, but they approach it as some sort of religious duty. Some sort of duty that needs to be checked off a list. Okay, I went to church today. I went to church this week. I said my prayers. I read my Bible. Now I can get about living my life my way. As if God is somehow impressed that we could make it to church and sit here for an hour 
as if he's somehow in heaven going, oh, wow, they went to church today. Wow, amazing. Like if that somehow impresses God. Too many think that they're putting God in their debt by their religious service, that God somehow owes them when nothing could be further from the truth. We are in God's debt. We owe him. We owe him our whole lives. We owe him all of our praise and all of our worship and all of our devotion. We owe him. Because he has been so gracious and merciful and good and rich towards us. And we give our worship to him gladly. Number one, because he is worthy. And number two, because he is so, so good. And we see his goodness in the rivers of his blessing that are always overflowing in our lives. And so for us to truly worship God in the act of worship, what must come before it is that lifestyle of ongoing and continuing worship. And so that when we cross the threshold, we enter into his gates, if you will, of, with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, we're ready to, to give expression to what we've been living out for the last seven days. So, number one, there is worship that God receives and worship that he rejects. Number two, not everything called worship is true worship. We must worship in spirit and in truth. Number three, true worshipers bring their first and their best. And number four, the act of worship should be preceded by the lifestyle of worship. Amen.